Greetings! Welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel, and we're going to tie another fly for stream fishing. We're going to tie a soft tackle, and soft tackle is, on one hand, a specific name given to some specific patterns, but it's also the name of a material, which is just any hackle that absorbs water. Now, I'm using a hen hackle today. You can also use game bird side feathers, rough grouse, ptarmigan, um, really any of them, right? Uh, for blacks, a lot of people, for small size, flies that are small in size and black, uh, starling feathers work very nicely and they're an invasive species that are pretty much unregulated anywhere in North America. Um, uh, partridge, gray partridge, English partridge, is a common soft tackle for the lighter shades. And this type of fly is probably the oldest, most traditional of all of the trout flies. It is a simple body, with or without a tail. If you want to imitate a mayfly, you add a tail. If you want to imitate a caddis fly or a dobson fly type thing, you don't add the tail. Like dobson fly and fish fly, you don't add the tail. Mayfly, you do. And what you're doing is you're imitating an adult insect that drowned either in the process of hatching or in, or after hatching, after laying eggs and then dying and falling back into the water. So um, also the ones without tails can imitate a mayfly which got stuck in the nymphal husk. Okay? So if you have a really long shank hook, you tie an extra long dubbed body, uh, again reference the dubbing nymph that we tied in the previous video. Um, if you extend the body a little bit longer and kind of curve it down the bend of the hook and then have a shorter length hackle, it will look like a mayfly that got stuck in the husk and was unable to successfully hatch. I like to fish these soft hackles when there's a hatch on because a lot of the trout, especially the larger trout, even if they look like they're feeding at the surface, they're often feeding just underneath the surface. Right, so they're attacking the flies, a, a, a fly which is up on the surface and is about to fly off. By the time fit the fish gets there, it might be gone. But one that's just under the surface is dead. It's not going anywhere. Even if it's not dead and is in the process of emerging onto the surface, that's a laborious process for the insect. And it's not going to just disappear by the time the trout shoots to the bottom to grab it. So even when most fly fishermen are fishing dry flies on top, I prefer to fish the soft tackles in the same type of pattern as you would use for a dry fly, and you'll actually catch more fish that way. Once in a while, you will see fish that are so keyed into the dry fly that they will not hit the, the, the soft tackle. I've experienced that once in 20 years of fishing. So, yeah, actually, yeah, close to 30 years of fishing. I've experienced that once, <laughs> where I could not raise a fish to wet fly, but a dry fly did the job. So this is why I don't fish with that many dry flies, because most of the time, you'll catch more under the surface than on top. Now, I, I also want to use this to introduce a couple more techniques. We're going to attach our thread just as we did before. And kind of the special technique that I want to introduce with this fly is managing thickness of the body and the head. As you get to more complex ties, you get more going on, and you get more and more stuff going on right here at the head of the fly, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it gets harder to tie it and wrap it without having problems of the thread collapsing and falling off. Okay. So this is a trick for managing that head thickness. I'm going to leave the section of the hook where the head will be completely bare while I get all of my materials tied in. I've selected a hackle from, this is just a hen saddleback, hen saddle hackle, okay? And I've selected fibers that are approximately the length of the hook shank. Now, this is gargantuan. This is absurdly big. Okay. This is absurdly big. I'm doing this because it's easier to show. And I'm going to tie this hackle in so that the, ta the tag end is pointing toward the hook rather than toward the eye. Okay. Be 
being clumsy. Okay. It's always easier to be clumsy when you're trying to do this for an audience. Yeah. Catch up my fingers, wrap down, leave the loop, and then pull up to close the loop for the first wrap in. Okay. Now I'm going to tie this in for half the length of the hook shank. And then snip everything off. And now for a tail, because I'm going to do this with everything, this would be for a mayfly version of this. Um, again, if you wanted to tie a caddisfly version of this, you would just select an appropriate color. We'll talk about color here at the end of the video, so don't go away. <laughs> um, and you would just not do a tail. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to line up some feather, some of these feather fluffs, so that their tips meet. Then I'm going to grab them and pull them straight off. Okay, and that little bundle is going to be my tail. So again, I want this so that they're about the same length as the hook shank. And then I'm going to tie these in. And you'll see that the point at which I started tying these in is the same as the point at which I ended the shaft of that feather. So now I have a smooth body all the way across without any lumps in it. Because the tails go one way, the shaft of the hack will go the other, and I have a smooth junction in between where I can attach my dubbing. And I'm just going to use a little bit, this is just a natural rabbit dubbing that I'm using here, just to have this light colored tie. I'm going to use some of this fluffy stuff from behind his ears. Muss it up. This I'm not too worried about being all that smooth, so I'm not going to do a dubbing loop to really pack it down. I've already demonstrated that technique. <coughs> I usually don't do that with just the body dubbing, but I wanted to demonstrate it in the last video. Okay. So I'm just spinning the dubbing on the thread. If you have trouble doing this, get a little bit of beeswax and wax your thread, and then it will stick a little bit. Now I'm going to wrap this on. Okay, I'm up to the hackle. So I have my body. Now, just like I did with the red when I was tying the flash minnow, I'm just going to muss up these feathers. And this is short enough, I'm going to go ahead and grab it with the hackle pliers. So I will grab the tip of that feather with the hackle pliers, hold it back, advance the thread all the way to the eye, wrap it, and every wrap I'm going to brush the hackle that I've already put on toward the back of the hook. Okay. That's plenty. You don't want an excess of hackle on these wet flies. Okay. Now you could tie a wing going over this. You don't have to. I usually don't. Okay. And there we have a soft hackle mayfly. Now. There's one more thing that you need to do. I talked about this uh, in the very first one where we did the flash minnow and the throat, the red, the red hackle throat for that. These hackle stems are very fragile and even the Velcro teeth of a trout or a bluegill will cut that after a fish or two. So what we want to do is I want to come back and I want to gently wrap through that and wiggle the thread so that I'm not matting down the hackle fibers. Okay. And wrap through it till I'm all the way back. Okay. Then do a wrap and now come back through it again. So I'm doing a whole bunch of figure eight wraps over this plume of chicken feathers. 
okay. And then just to kind of get it all going where I want, I'm going to brush it back, hold it with my fingers, and then just do one or two wraps right at the base, again overlapping some of the fibers that are all the way out in front, so it directs it backwards. And that is now a finished fly. I will do my half hitches, or whip finish, depending on your preference. Then again, if you want to do your whip finish, I'll demonstrate this another time. Catch it with your two fingers. Put them across the thread. And then let it spin so that the thread comes down on top and is caught between the standing end and the hook shank. And then just wrap it. That's how you do a finger whip finish. Do four or five of those. Pull it tight. and lacquer. And we have a soft tackle. Now, I do want to talk a minute about color. And this is one place, it does matter with these sorts of flies, especially when we get into the adults, because the grubs tend to be all gray and brown. You've basically got light brown, dark brown, and black. Other than, I mean the golden stone is a little different, yes. But, other than the golden stone, you pretty much have light brown, dark brown, and black. You have a lot more color variation in the adults, okay? Like this would be a reasonable slate drake kind of imitation or a um, or smaller, you know, smaller, darker hexagenia day, something. One of the burrowing mayflies would be imitated by something of this size and this color. The thing you have to remember about trout in streams, and well, most fish in small streams, is that very rarely are they going to suspend in the middle of the water column, okay? They are down on the bottom behind a rock, <laughs> okay? Rock, fish, current. And they're hiding behind a rock because it takes much less energy to hold their place in the fast current. So trout or really any fish in a small stream, a fast moving small stream, are almost always at the bottom. They will come up and attack food at various places in the water column, and then they descend right back to the bottom. It's an energy-saving thing. It's important for them to stay alive. They have to save as much energy as possible. So if you think about that, the fish is down here. Your fly is above it almost all of the time. So when it sees the fly, it's seeing it in silhouette against the sun. Think about what you see when you see something in silhouette. You don't see a lot of color detail. So when I think about color on these, I think about three colors, light, medium, and dark. And when you, when you look at it, it's the human instinct to take the fly and hold it in front of you and look at it this way. It's not how the fish sees it. The fish sees it from below. So when you want to look at your fly and ask what color is the fish going to see, take the fly and hold it against the sky and look at it from below yourself. You'll see that a lot of these little details in color that a lot of fishermen get all uptight about just vanish when you're viewing it from that proper angle. Right? So the difference between light gray and tan is irrelevant. The difference between dark brown, dark olive, and black is irrelevant, okay? White is distinct from light gray. And there are a few mayflies, um, sulfurs, and some of the larger hex nymphs that are translucent and yellowish. And there you want to use sort of like a really bright yellow or orange for your materials because the, re the, the reflection from the body will kind of mimic the translucency in the natural insect. There are a few exceptions to this. But except for those exceptions, just think about like a white or very, very, very pale version, a medium gray, this would be a medium, what I just tied for you, and a dark. And then you want to have the size of the insects in your stream in light, medium, and dark. And don't worry too much about whether it's light gray or a light olive. It's light. 
okay? Um, do have a white, and I do like to have some in like a really bright yellow in case I would bump into one of those insects. Um, usually the sulfurs are very small, like size 16 or smaller, and the large yellow hex nymphs are very big, like a size 4 like I just tied. So you don't need the whole size range in those, but I do like to keep a couple of bright yellow and bright orange wet flies in my fly box in case I bump into those, one of those when I'm not expecting it. But you just kind of have the two extremes in size on those. Um, if you're out west and you have large yellow stone fly hatches, then you want to imitate that as a special case. But for most trout, most places in the world, some little buggy wet flies and soft tackles like this. And again, with the tail for a mayfly, cut the tail off for a caddisfly. Tie them all with tails. And if you want to do a caddisfly, just snip them off stream side. Right? Don't get uptight about trying to have 10 of every possible variation. Light, medium, dark, and whatever special cases you might, you know, and then a handful for whatever special cases you might get into in your area. Keep it simple. This is the origin of fly fishing. Okay? So I hope you found this useful. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, and I will see you next time on Old Ways Rising Farm.